Welcome to a very special episode of the Known Pleasures podcast. Today, we are honoured to be interviewing Rusty Egan, former drummer with the Skids and the Rich Kids, founding member of Visage, and DJ at the legendary Blitz Club in London. Rusty has also been a record producer and arranger, and is still active today in music composition and production. There is a link in the description that will take you to some of the wonderful music he has produced recently, including collaborations with Boy George, Tony Hadley, and Bono. When we recorded this episode, Rusty was not only prompt and raring to go, he was actually a little early, so I got to ask this question before Mark and Patrick arrived. Can I ask you a question about that time, about the Blitz? It, 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 yeah. I am forever amazed at the fact that people were listening to the Sex Pistols and then a couple of years later, people wanted to dance to Chic and um, Donna Summer in a club. It, it, it just seems like such a huge leap. It's, it's not like they were listening to reggae, then they were listening to ska. It just seemed like a huge leap. Did you kind of see that coming? Before they were listening to the Sex Pistols, a lot of them were soul, soul boys. Mm, they went okay. to uh, clubs. They went to weekenders. Um, and if you go into the history of England, teenagers went to like Brighton and it was like mods and rockers. Yeah? Mm, you know yeah, about yeah. that. Yeah. And there were motorbikes and they were like mods, which is like mm. quadrophenia. So yeah. when you were young, you went to the seaside. <laughs> and then they had an all day DJs yeah. called an all dayer, an all dayer. And you could just pay 50p. And you yeah. went in there and you were wearing your cool clothes and you met girls and yeah. you might have had your first your first beer. You hated the taste of it, but you tried to make <laughs> out you liked it. And you had a cigarette and you were cool. And they were playing disco. Or okay. if you listen to a Clash song, he shouts out the Lacey Lady in a Clash mm. song. Oh, okay. I think it's Janie Jones. Janie, Janie Jones. Jones. Yeah, and the Lacey Lady was a club where people went uh, who were cool, but mm. like broke, working class kids. But if, even if you had no money, you mm. could dance. Right. You could okay. dance. And you knew Prince Buster. You, yeah. you knew Tighten Up Volume 2. You mm. knew the music that inspired Madness and Scar. Mm. You, you knew all that stuff. That was your right. thing. The Blitz Club started out in uh, Billy's in Soho. Mm -hmm. Was a collection of people that had gone to all of the punk gigs. January the 1st, 1977, at the Roxy. And uh, I've got the book here, look. You can see it. Oh, wow. The Roxy. Yeah, I went round Andy's house. Andy Chazowski, I went yeah. round his house um, uh, about two months ago and I filmed it and I put it on um, on my social media and I picked up the original demo to Tar that Steve Strange done when mm -hmm. Andy Chazowski managed Steve Strange and Andy was a Malcolm McLaren character as in he had a clothes shop. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. And Andy and Susan Carrington have been together since 1966 or something. And they met at a cool college and they had they had closed shops and they were very anarchistic against society, which I loved. And they had um, a basement of the closed shop, which they let bands rehearse for free. Chrissy Hind, Chrissy Hind started out there. So there's a lot of photographs by Sheila Rock around that. Okay. Anyway, so the bottom line, Steve Strange was in the basement screaming into a microphone and he said, do you want to work in a shop a couple of days a week to help pay the rent? You know, he said, mm. I don't pay any rent. I'll just stay at my mate's sofa. <laughs> Me, my sofa. So you, you were paying the rent? <laughs> I was paying the rent. I don't know how DJing, I suppose. <laughs> I'm writing currently, right now, with Peter Hook. Mm. I have a record out already with Peter Hook. Um, 
One minute. Was, was that Peter? Was up. that Peter singing on that one? By the way. Yes. Oh, here it is. Ah, oh, one second. Peter oh, Hook. Wow. What a what a record. Amazing. Right. And there's four mixes on here, and one of the mixes is by Youth. Oh yeah, I know Youth. Yeah. I'm killing Joe. I'm killing Joe. Just yeah. produced. Just produced the last Skids album, and they've got a track on the last Skids album called um, "Destination Dusseldorf." <laughs> um, and Jobson, who I spoke to the other week, is living in Berlin. Yeah. And we made an album called "Days in Europa." Yeah, I remember this. I've, I've got that. I've got that album. Yeah. Well, I'm the drummer. You see. Oh wow! And if you listen to all the drums. I was trying to perfect the perfect drummer. That album was done with Bill Nelson. Mm. And if you listen to it on headphones, you will hear in the drum sound, you'll hear drum machines and things on a track called Charade. Animation. Animation, the drums. I mean, I was into this whole sound of the drummer. And Mm. I was work into a click track. Now, when I got in the studio as a producer with The Cult, they got a song called Resurrection Joe. And I convinced the record label to let me go in the studio with them because I was mm-hmm. a friend of Billy. And I went to, I produced Spear of Destiny after them. But anyway, the point was, I was trying to get them to do that. <laughs> I was trying to get them. And the bottom line is they used to come to my club because this is about 82, you know. Right. And I had the biggest club in London, which is now called Coco. But I basically, I was basically beat matching from the late 70s. And I was playing two hearts beat as one by U2. 12 inch mix. I was playing Billy Idol, you know, and I was joining them all together and then going into like Alice, you know, you know, the song called Alice. Yeah. And basically, I've uploaded a mix on my mix cloud from a dog day afternoon with a live concert at Crystal Palace about a month ago. Yeah. Where I was the DJ on stage with no volume. Very odd, very odd. But anyway, <laughs> I record what I do and I always share it after. And then people go, oh my God, the Saints are on it, actually. Oh, um, right. And I do, I mix together for like two or three hours hmm. all the punk records. I, I just DJ and I'm a drummer. So I can oh. go from one. Well, on guitar, hey, oh, let's go, hey, oh, do 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 and the next thing you know, you're into the dance, you know, and I basically did a non-stop punk mix, that's what it's called, and it's the Buzzcocks, the Skids, the Dan, the Saints, the Clash, the Pistol, I just did a non-stop, and then it goes, um, it goes into the Rizzillos, Everybody's on top of the pops. And back to drumming. The point is that I knew that the drum machine, Kraftwerk, showroom dummies, extended 12-inch mixes, DJs are just still playing disco. They're yowza, yowza, you know, yeah, like. Yeah. But out of disco came Chic, Nile mm. Rogers. Who produced Let's Dance for David Bowie? Who produced Notorious for Duran Duran? I mean, the man is a total and utter genius. So just because you go to a punk gig Mm. and there's disco in the other room, Mm. there's amazing punk and there's crap punk. There's amazing disco and there's crap disco. So Mm. all I was as a DJ was... The same thing that Brian Eno said, I'm not a musician. I'm not a DJ. 
And if you go, <laughs> hey, I'm a DJ, I go, hey, hi, DJ. What are you, uh, what equipment are you using, man? <laughs> I was like, I don't care. I just yeah. put on records. Brilliant records. At this point, Mark and Patrick arrived at the studio with questions in hand. We discussed the early 80s and some of the projects some people may not realise he was involved in. I've, I've told this story many times now, but I created the drums to the art of noise. Nobody knows. Oh, wow. oh really? Really? Okay. And, and I made a, a very bad album by Visage because we basically split up and the record company was going, you have to deliver an album under the terms of the agreement. I said, but the band split up. Yeah, yeah. but <laughs> you have to deliver an album. Like, All right, well, I, I, I've got a couple of ideas, you know. And um, I called up this bloke called J.J. Jesselik, and he had done the le- lexicon of love. Right. And it yeah, yeah. turned out he, he was the guy that was looking after the fair light that Richard James Burgess, who comes from New Zealand, uh, who was my partner and we produced records together, yeah. he had the fair light yeah. and J.J. Jesselik was the roadie bringing it and yeah. nobody knew how to work it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So he got the manual and he was like at home having a sandwich going, right, yeah, right. right. And then he'd show up, plug it in, and then people would look at him going, well, yeah, well, well, that's it. And they go, yeah, but we don't know how to work it. They go, yeah, but you have to get hold of someone to do it. We go, look, I'll show you how it sort of works. And that's how he ended up being the only bloke who knew how to make all these sounds. So owner of a lonely heart. <laughs> and all that. Uh, uh, and then Trevor Hall was like, I've got another job tomorrow. I've got another job tomorrow. And he ended up full-time bloke working on this fair light. Yeah, yeah. So I called him up and he goes, oh, 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 I want 500 pounds for a day. Wow. And I go, all right. And he comes to the studio, plugs it in. And basically I said, I want to create this drum sound. I'm a drummer. And we spent all day making this drum sound. And then um, I did a vocal and it with one finger I went beep boy beep 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 boy <laughs> oh that's good I can go beep boy beep 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 boy oh, oh, forget that just go beep boy <laughs> beep boy okay and we created this track then we did the bass and we had a really good day and I paid him 500 pounds and then we ended up having litigation with Ultravox's management because that was that was where all the arguments came in because um, I was kicked out of Fade to Grey and Ultravox mm. were now more important and all that kind of shit. So I thought, okay, well, stop fucking managing us then and we'll get on with it ourselves. Mm. Anyway, cut a long story sideways. Beat Boy doesn't get released and I hear Beatbox on the radio. <laughs> so I call up JJ at Psalm Studios, Trevor Horn. And he goes, you should have kept the floppy disk. <laughs> <laughs> One to learn from. <laughs> well, I did the drums to the theme tune to Top of the Pops. Oh, wow. Which is Yellow Pearl. Mm. Was that um, Thin Lizzy, Phil Lennon? Yeah. yeah. I played on his album, Solo in Soho, four <laughs> tracks. That was oh. one of them. And then it becomes the theme tune to Top of the Pops. So this is Mark, hey, Mark. this is Patrick, Patrick. and uh, you met me, I'm Graham. Uh, you, I normally introduce the, uh, the podcast uh, to, to the people, but, but, but you've already, you already know what we're about. <laughs> we're, um, I, I re- really like what you're about, and I'm a complete and utter fan of um, Joy Division. All right, uh, all right. I tried to listen to Warsaw the other day. Mm. I tried to listen to it because, of course, it was the first, you know. Mm. Um, and I am currently writing a song. Well, we've written a song. It's called "Lost" with Peter Hook. Oh, fantastic! And I, I was, I was at uh, Peter Hook at the Isle of Wight uh, a few months ago mm. in the first few rows, and um, you, you, me, 
I just forgot how many amazing <laughs> songs they had. Yeah, yeah. And every time he, he finished a song and another one started, I'd be oh, my God, another one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great one. tour. He played here in November and it was amazing. He was oh, fantastic. Oh, he's unbelievable. Now, we all know he's not a singer, right? He's not a singer. No. But that means he doesn't have an octave range, right? Right? Mm. Yeah. I, I sing, I sing all in one octave, right? Mm. Well, that was a style of Iggy Pop. Remember, it was like, it, it was a style. If you listen to certain people, mm. they never go out of that octave, like maybe Nick Cave or something. Mm. You know, it, it's a nice style. Um, love, love will tear us apart again. Yeah. I mean... Even Fate to Grey, I could sing that one man on a lonely platform. Yeah, yeah. I actually vocode them, um, vocode on my own album. I wrote a song called When We Were Young. Yeah, that's great. And it's really good. It's me, it's all me, all the words, everything, it's all me. My, I've got one question for you. The end of 1978, the rich kids are breaking up. Why is nobody else doing what you decided to do? Why are you the only person that thought, I'm going to open a club and start playing, uh, you know, Roxy, Bowie, Susie and the Banshees? Why did nobody else come up with that idea in 1978? Well, <laughs> I wouldn't say nobody. When I was in punk bands, I travelled the country and I'm very social. Um, I have to meet people and I'm also very inclusive I, I, I emphasize that because the Blitz Club was exclusive mm. and they they misinterpreted keeping people out that are homophobic <laughs> and yeah. thugs and drunks basically Saturday night in any town and you <laughs> oh, I'm not going up I'm not going to King's Cross on a Saturday night, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, Keeping that element out of our environment, you had to say, sorry, sir, um, I don't like the white polar neck tonight. You know, no white polar necks, oh. whatever. So, <laughs> yeah, you had to keep people out. Um, so I went the length of the country and I found Simple Minds. I found Soft Cell. I found the movie. I found a band in every town, everywhere I went. And I found people that didn't want to go to King's Cross on Saturday night. They didn't want to be out with violent people. They didn't want to be in an environment of, Oi, one, two, three, four, <laughs> going to be a boss to break out. We were like, well, I'm going to stay at home then. Yeah. You know, uh, punk, punk's finished. Uh, I don't want to go and see The Clash because uh, I don't want to get beaten up. You know, yeah, yeah. I was at the first gig. Now I don't want to be at the 5,000 people want to kill each other gig. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, and I've got nowhere to go. So basically, in Manchester was a club called Pips, and they had one room that a guy played music. Check out a bloke called Greg Wilson, DJ. Amazing guy, amazing archivist for the music that was going on in the Midlands and up north Birmingham. Birmingham, they had the Rum Runner, yeah. Mm. Yeah. which is where Duran Duran and Nick Rhodes was the DJ from Duran Duran. Um, in Leeds, where Marvin was the cloakroom attendant at the Warehouse Club, um, Ian Dewhurst was the DJ. A few years later, I brought him to London, about 84. Um, he was a former... Wigan Casino DJ, which is why he played um, Gloria Gaynor's song or Gloria Jones, Gloria Jones' Tainted Love. And Mark Harmon ran out of the cloakroom going, oh, my God, what's this song? <laughs> and uh, Whatever happened Ian to him? It's a <laughs> Northern Soul classic. Yes. And um, so basically that throughout the country there were um, – people that felt the same and that liked Joy Division, David Bowie, Roxy Music, hadn't knew a bit about craft work or uh, Depeche Mode didn't exist. Um, OMD, <coughs> you know, there were, there were people that were into electronics that I was in, not just electronic, but more Bowie, Roxy. Yeah. And if you like Bowie and Roxy, you like Brian Eno. And if you like Brian Eno, you thought, what's all that weird music Brian Eno makes? Who, who, Who's 
Mo- Mobius and Cluster, mm. and and if you liked, if you liked Ultravox, you said, "Who's Connie Plank?" Mm. So I was, you know, basically a guy that read the album cover and thought, "Who's that?" Now you just right click, <laughs> you know. But then <laughs> uh, I found a broken head on Eno Mobius Cluster. I was just a broken head. I stole the world that ever stumble, slide and stumble, slide and stumble. King's lead hat put the poker in the fire. Uh, uh, talking heads is an anagram of that. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. But anyway, <laughs> King's lead hat, I played guitar with Ultrabox. I can play basic guitar. And I played it on stage in LA in December 1979 with Ultravox in L.A. And then I went to um, New York. I went to the Mud Club. I went to Paradise Garage. I saw New Order in the 80s. I went to the Hurrah Club. I saw Simple Minds magazine. And I was like, Simple Minds magazine and um, Ultravox, these are the three bands that, to me, are going into... New Waters, meaning electronic dance music. I can dance to Quiet Men. I can dance to the light pours out of me. I can dance to Life in a Day and Chelsea Girl. And do, 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 yeah. Oh, this is it. So basically, I just got all my 12-inch mixes and Suicide. Oh, oh, went to Rough Trade and stood there all day with a bloke going, there's a bloke. 16 Decoy Avenue. He's made this record and it goes warm. Leatherette. <laughs> Leatherette. I'll have that. <laughs> oh, what is that? TVOD. I want that. Oh, you like that? Oh, you, what about this? Okay. Are you ready? Ba-doo, listen to the. Oh, I want that. I want that. And basically, I stood in there all day long and went through everything going, no, what's that? Red frame, white light. What's that? What's that? Ricky's hand, fad gadget. Oh, give me that, give me that. <laughs> so basically, the guy used to add my phone number on a bit of paper and he'd ring me and he'd go, are you coming? There's a lot of music coming. I'd go, yeah, I'm coming to get my music for the club, you know. Mm. And then I'd go to this shop that sold punk records and uh, on the wall was all the first ever punk records, including Rich Kids and The Clash and The Damned and The Pistols. And, and I'd seen every one of them unsigned. You know, I'd been at every gig. Um, and basically, I was like, what's this record? And there was the odd punk record that I really liked but it wasn't right for the club. It's a bit of a weird thing. You have a radar, like when you do a radio show and you know, you know what you're playing and you, you've got the sound in your head and then a record would come and you, oh, that's too miserable or something. Then you go home and it's atmosphere mm. and you're like, oh, I've got to play it, but <laughs> I'll play it. I play it early evening yeah. and I put it on just after Craftwork, the entire album, Autobahn, 20 minutes of yeah. it, you know, and then Jean Michel Jarre, the whole album. And then, of course, I, I, I went to Dusseldorf and Berlin and came back armed with Nina Hag and African yeah. Reggae and, and Noi and Can. And I've just had it. I had uh, Wolfgang Riechmann, Wunderbar, and Michael Rauder, Michael Rauder. He's out on the road now. He's amazing. I supported him at a couple of shows. The guy's amazing. So I'm a total enthusiast. And of course, no interview with Rusty would be complete without discussing craft work. The fact that craft work came to my club and danced on my dance floor <laughs> a, few, a few times and came back to my flat was fantastic wow. mm. but did, did they, they were just sh- <laughs> they were just shocked that somebody showed up in Dusseldorf yeah, in 1970 yeah. <laughs> 78 or 79 what was yeah, the, like 78 what, 79 uh, Rusty what was the craft work dance style how did they, <laughs> they how did they move about well work? you won't believe it but they danced to I Want More by Can I don't <laughs> know if you know yep. the track yep. it, it was covered by Blamange oh, oh okay, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. who I, I absolutely love. And um, 
Neil Arthur has continued, like me, <laughs> to make to make great music. Um, I tell a lovely story about um, being invited to Craftwork at the London Royal Albert Hall by a society friend of mine whose family bank I have a box. Right. And she normally sends me a message, ABC are doing the Albert Hall. And I go, oh, brilliant, I'd love to go. And then I don't ask the band for tickets. Mm. And I just go, hey, guys, I'm going to be there in <laughs> box <laughs> number. <laughs> and then somebody might show up from backstage and go, Martin and Julie would love you to come backstage after. And so I think that's very nice, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, yeah, a nice absolutely. way to go, I'd like to come backstage after. <laughs> so this happened during craft work, exactly one day he came to the club and they brought that record called um, uh, The One With The Ride In The Bikes. <laughs> oh, Tour De France? Um, didn't they do Yeah, they year? brought Tour De France 12 inch. Yeah. And what happened was they'd heard New Order, um, Blue Monday, and they said, oh my God, we." we better go to whatever studio they mixed and mastered that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And they, they went to um, Britannia Row. Pink Floyd owned it. And uh, then they said, we'll take it to Rusty's Club and put it on and hear it in the sound system. So um, but basically that was another time that Craftwork came. In terms of the, the influence you had as a DJ on the music scene in the early 80s and onwards from from there and I mean everyone from from Martin Kemp to Boyd George to whoever will 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 talk about how the sound of of Blitz was was your sound and the 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 thought kind of occurred to me that like all the the, the unusual mu- music that that you brought to Blitz um, is it just as well that you weren't a big fan of George Formby and ukulele Songs, for instance, <laughs> so that the the sound of the eighties could have been quite different. Yeah. <laughs> well, I personally believe that the collection of people that amalgamated in one place at that time was the equivalent of the same as punk, the same as Studio Fifty Four, the same as Liverpool in the sixties. And I presume you've had a couple of those moments in Australia mm. where. A few clubs blew up and a few DJs blew up and there was a, people talking about, oh, that time. I think it was a kind of magical time where Punk had just said, get a band together, do a magazine, do something. So like you said, uh, Mr. White Polonek, dude, why <laughs> didn't anybody else start a club? Well, everybody did. And if you go into my social media, I've got Rusty Egan, I've got Rusty A. Egan. I've got Rusty Egan Presents. Um, and I've got RustyEgan.com. And I give everything away. Nine out of ten people say, why don't you do a book? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? I go, because I'm alive. I'm yeah. here. Yeah. Nobody wants to book you. Nobody wants to book you. You know, I don't care. I don't need money. Why don't you need money? Because I don't need material things. I just mm. live on fuck all. I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't drive a car. They cut mm. themselves off. They go in the middle of nowhere, they paint pictures. They don't care about the anything. Some agent, yeah, he'll sell it. A gallery, he'll sell it. Fine, mm. I make music. That's it. Every now and again, a friend will call me and go, Iggy Pop, the Buzzcocks, Glenn Matlock, um, Billy Idol, you know, Generation X, will you put some music on? Yeah, okay, and you get there and there's no volume. You go, okay. But there is. It's people are at the bar talking and you're just standing there putting the records on. And you have to then remove, I'm going to entertain this crowd as a DJ to I'm going to be the background guy. But I'll upload my selection onto my mix cloud and then you get the comments in the mix cloud the Saints, I'd forgotten about the Saints. Oh, my God, you played that record. Oh, my God, the transition. You mixed Joy Division in with us. <laughs> and you get it all from people all around the world. But yeah, yeah, yeah. 10, 20,000 people were in yeah. front of me, and I didn't have any volume. And I was like, oh, well, I'll just play some great background music. Sometimes you have to be in the background. Sometimes you can be the DJ in the Jesus position and press play, <laughs> and all you get is eh, eh. And I go, what a fucking talent. What an unbelievable talent. He took he took um, a bit of 
Uh, what's it called? Is it called I Want You? Uh, what they call that band? Uh, not sure. I I could take that band from uh, New Zealand and I could cut it up. Oh, so, split ends. Split ends. I got you. Split ends. I, I got you. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 I, I got you, 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 you. Come on, everybody. <laughs> it's the drop. <laughs> I got you, 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 you. And then that's the end of the song. That's the end of the song. That's all it does. And then he'll go, check out my new tune. Mm. My new tune. <laughs> yeah. Not your new Not tune. At Not at all. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you go into my SoundCloud... Or you go into my mix cloud. Pretty good. Mm. I've remixed you two. Yeah, I heard that. Uh, three of them have been released. Two of them have been released, three mixes of each. But there's another song with four mixes that were not released, but they're on my mix cloud. And when I do four mixes, I strip a song down. I go, oh my God, Bono with just a piano. Oh, oh. You know, and then I go, oh, I'll put a heartbeat in there. Oh, and then I'll put a bit of string. And I go, I've got another one. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll do it in a, a 120 BPM. And I basically try out ideas. I've done La Rue, mm-hmm. which wasn't released, but you can hear it. Mm. Madonna, I, I do a thing where I go back to mixes I did in the 80s and I bring them back to the future. So I've got Madonna 220. And then I've got 16 minutes of Madonna where I mixed all the versions together nonstop. <laughs> and none of them are available for sale. You just listen on SoundCloud. Right. And then I've got Dubstar. Yep. I, I did an amazing song for Dubstar, but I, I sent out 40 tracks, contracts, 40 tracks I was releasing on an album called Welcome to the Remix Volume 2. And we released the album before Dubstar signed the contract, but we'd agreed all the terms. And then they said, sorry, you released the record and we didn't sign it. And I said, well, just get the contract I sent you and sign it and put it in the post. And their lawyer said, no, I'm going to take it down and you have to take it down. And to me, it's kind of like, a double booking you show up for a gig and another guy showed up Mm. and you go oh it's a double booking and then you go oh who wants to do the gig and you go i don't care as long as i get paid right (laughs) and you go yeah don't worry let's just get the gig done and we'll sort out getting paid at the end of the month right uh yeah so basically they pulled the track so i said okay well i'll put it on my soundcloud then and it's beautiful it's a beautiful song and i met sarah many times and she's absolutely adorable and she literally said i don't do any of the business rusty i don't like to fall out with people you know <laughs> and i said i wish i didn't do it even i wouldn't <laughs> fall out with people but um it's a great record so yeah. uh so there's 40 well it's 38 tracks now <laughs> on that album I just had one last question for you, Rusty, and it's it's just about Visage. When you were putting the band together, it's an amazing band lineup with magazine and everything else. Why was Midge never considered to be the singer? Why did you think you needed to get Steve Strange? And I know that's a bit of a rocky road down the track, but Midge obviously could sing and did go on to be a very successful singer. Why not him? Well, um, some friends of mine have got a, a podcast called uh, Electronic Cafe. Yes. And I've introduced them to 20 people. And to, last night I watched Billy Curry. Uh, so it's brand new. And he reminded me that I dragged him and Mitch to see Simple Minds and Magazine uh-huh. at the Drury Lane Theatre. Wow. And I looked it up. It was May 1979. Wow. And I dragged everyone into the Blitz Club. And then I played Noi and basically played them all my music to say, I need to get this sound (laughs) on that dance floor. (laughs) We don't want to boogie, oogie, oogie all night long. (laughs) We don't go yowza, yowza, yowza. Although I'm playing Chic, I'm playing Sheila B. Devotion, Nile Rogers, what a great record, Spacer. I'm Mm. playing Georgia Moroda. This is a sound. But is there any way we can 
get Ultravox magazine. I, I want to mix this sound. So it was like, and, and drum machine, because I want to be able to mix it with craft work and whatever. So it was a studio project from the off. And Mitch got the call from Phil Linnett. I got the call from the skids. Billy got the call from uh, Gary Newman. Yeah. None of us were going to be a band. Right. We weren't going to be around. So when we basically said, let's get a rehearsal room together and do some ideas, I was already making a hundred quid a week, which would double what I was making being in the rich kids <laughs> from having 200, kids, yeah. <laughs> 200 kids paying me uh, 50p. Yeah. To, to come to a club mm. and having free dinner, you know, my rent was 12 quid, you know. So I was able to finance a rehearsal room, rent a rehearsal room, and a, the band all had roadies and stuff because they were all working musicians. And we started to sort of make some noise. And Midge and I had already done The Dancer. Yeah. We'd already done it in the year 2525. We'd already done whatever. We we knew what we were. And Mitch had a Yamaha CS80. I had a CR78 drum machine. I had uh, Richard Burgess, who um, had all the drum equipment I needed. So we, we just had what we needed. And we had me driving it with people going, oh, John's just joined Pill. Oh, okay. Well, he'll be back. <laughs> you know? Oh, <laughs> Billy's doing that. Oh, Barry's with uh, Nick Cave. What? Who, who's Nick Cave? Oh, they're doing a gig tomorrow. Go down. I went to see them. They're all fucking mad drug addicts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I saw Nick Cave in West Hampstead, and uh, he looked like he was going to die on stage and sweating and skinny and <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, so the bottom line was this band is never going to get it together, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, to be a band, you know. But what, what, what we can do is we can date the essence of the Blitz, which is me and Steve, and we can put it on the cover and we can put it in the video and we can just make amazing music, really. And if you think I Feel Love was played all over the world and nobody ever saw Donna Summer on stage, I don't know. Did she ever play? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um Sheila B. Devotion, which, who was she? I don't know, I like the music. Oh, some French girl, you know. I mean, we didn't know who half the artists were, we just liked the record, you know. Mm. So let's make the record, really. That was it, really, you know. Well, and we well, did. Like, you invented the <sighs> 80s. A lot of the sound of the 80s is that, well, what you just described. Without, without pissing anyone off, um, I haven't written a book, but if I do write a book, it was going to be called Burn Your Bridges. And there's a joke in the fact that I'm going to be a pensioner. <laughs> and I met you and my, my friend, uh, godfather of my uh, oldest boy. I'm the worst godfather of his youngest daughter. I introduced him to his wife. Um, I was at his uh, wedding. He was at mine, that kind of thing. The point really is, is that I have never let him know how I felt about us never being uh, produced by Midge and Rusty. And I've never let him know how I felt about not being credited as a writer in Fade to Grey. Yeah. Um, and I I am over the moon that he finished off Glorious, a song that started with Chris Payne and me. And we had written the chorus but the verse and the bridge and the build up, Mitch did it all. And I think, I like to say Mitch, Warren Can, the drummer in Ultravox, is a co-writer of Vienna and every single song. And the drummer in uh, Coldplay, and the drummer in U2, mm. and the drummer in Echo and the Bunnyman who died on a motorbike. Mm-hmm. His wife is a friend of mine, and she still gets paid his share from Echo and the Bunnyman. Mm-hmm. She, she and his kids are always getting paid mm-hmm. from the management of Echo and the Bunnyman. Mm-hmm. And there have been many people saying, 
the keyboard player that was in um, Bobby Gillespie's band who died a depressed man mm. got cut out scream a delica and he never got paid and and there are a hundred stories of people um Dex's midnight runners uh, Johnny Fingers wrote um I don't like Mondays but never got credited he goes on and on and on yeah. okay that's fine but if I wrote a book and I said you know the art annoys the drums it's not necessarily about the money but you know what um, when I was homeless, the money would have been handy. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. And when when I had to DJ in the club that I used to own and get paid and have to wait in line to get paid from the person who owns the club and drink a glass of water all night um, <laughs> and do that. And basically when you – hear Fade to Grey being played all over the world and a cover version of Fade to Grey gets sold to an advertising company as a sync right and they don't pay even you as a performer. Mm -hmm. So you're not a writer and now you're not a performer. You basically are written out of your own legacy. Mm -hmm. And when you've got a sick wife and three children and you're DJing in a wedding um, for some radio DJ that never did fuck all, but he's very rich <laughs> um, for reading the top 40, whatever. And you sort of think, well, maybe I'll do, hi, you're listening to 80s radio and <laughs> this is true by Spano Ballet. <laughs> and then you go, here comes Tainted Love and here comes Duran Duran. Oh, and this is Fate to Grey. Um, you go, no, I listen to your um, uh, known pleasures. I listen to quite a few of them. Oh, and right. I know I know quite a lot of the people, including the Peter Hook one. Yeah. And I listen to a lot of them. And I sort of think there are some people that pop up on my social media Mm. and I go, oh, you sold out. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's like, oh my God, I can't believe you made that record. And then you did that. And I can understand if you've got a wife and kids at home Mm. and, uh, and your band is going through the um, wilderness period, you know, but I think because I didn't do anything in the wilderness period is really why I am true to myself. Mm. And and if you listen to 2009 to 2023 and you hear what I did with Boy George. Sister, Sister Mary Davies. Sister, Bono. Isn't that Tony had the girl inside you dying. Wolfgang Fleur coming up. Space. Mid year. Um I'm writing at the moment with Earl Slick. Mid year. No, Mitch. I can't explain it. Mitch is number one, but maybe Mike Scott from the Waterboys would be number two. Because he said yes and Mitch said no. And it's all like that. It's yeah. Holly Johnson lives around the corner. I see him in m and and I go, hey, Holly. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I got your song, but I'm a bit busy. All right, Holly. <laughs> I remember big in Japan. I know. Oh, I know. You were at my first gig. You know, no <laughs> joke. Anyway, but when I when I go, oh, I tried to get hold of the guy in, um, you know, I have a David. Oh, if I can get hold of him, you know. So I continue to try to do yeah. things. Mm. But if... If somebody called me and said, right, Rusty, guaranteed, Taylor Swift, I go, don't even end the conversation. Mm. No, no, you got to hear me out. End the conversation. <laughs> She's got a song called Romantics. I don't care. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's romantic and, 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 and I don't care. <laughs> Rusty, you're always going to be broke. <laughs> yeah. I only needed the money when I was... 20 years ago when I had three kids. I don't need it now. Yeah. I'm going to burn my fucking bridges. That's the book, time. That's the book. I'm going to say, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, 
I mean, Mitch is playing the Royal Albert Hall on the 4th of October, and he's going to be 70 years old wow. on the um, 10th of October. And I'm writing a book um, with the guy who wrote the story of Some Bizarre Records. Do you know that book? No. Some Bizarre. No, I, know some bizarre yeah. I, I spoke to him on the phone the other day, and, and you think talking to me is hard work. Jesus <laughs> right. Anyway, he's bringing it all up. Imagine if you, as 55, 60-year-old men, had to talk about 40 years ago, your first girlfriend at uni, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, uh, you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna touch on some some moments, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I've re- I've written a song on my new album with Zane Griff called "Visions of You," and it's basically I, I tell anyone they should do this: take a day off, go to your suburban house where you were a teenager, yeah. mm-hmm. sit outside the house and look at your bedroom, look at the bedroom wall, yeah. and welling up. And remember being in that bedroom and yeah. having your headphones on and listening to that album yeah. and remembering what art has touched you yeah. and being a, I'm a creep, I'm a weirdo, not yeah. wanting to know all the other kids' shit, horrible crap. And then you meet one bloke down the road called Mark Wallace who says, hey, I'm going to be a T-boy in a studio and I'm going to get you in. And... uh Mark Wallace went on to be the sound engineer on um, With or Without You by U2. Um, Mark Mark Wallace got me my first ever job out of that bedroom. And I shared with three other brothers, four (laughs) kids, four kids in one room. room. Anyway, so what I'm saying is you meet your first girlfriend, you get your first kiss and she still keeps the chewing gum in her mouth <laughs> and you've never forgot it. <laughs> Says, all right. She takes it out and gives you a kiss, puts her chewing gum back. And then you go to the park bench where you had your first kiss. Anyway, yeah. you basically go over your teenage, your teenage first love. Mm-hmm. And then you write, as I walk the streets along, mm-hmm. past your door. I see visions of you. We would dance all through the night. Walk home in the morning light. I see visions of you. I, I should have read between the lines. Didn't see the sign or the pain in your eyes. You set me free and now I walk alone eternally dumb into <laughs> well, I've, 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 got, I've got your voice now so I can put some music under yeah, there that's it. We've got that song. <laughs> well I've already done it with Zane Griff and Chris Payne yeah. and yes. um, Gary Barnacle on saxophone who's on tour with Soft Cell um, what I'm saying is when you when you touch upon what you are really about, mm. when you guys look at your record collection, the house is burning down. I've got to get my record collection. Yeah, yeah. What about the kids? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they can look after themselves. <laughs> yeah, they'll be fine. <laughs> they got legs. Yeah. Run, run. <laughs> they get their own record. I'm not gonna <laughs> not losing my Joy Division album. It's right. original. That's it. That's anyway, it. so all I'm saying is, yeah. I get, I get, still get emotional. And the fact that we were called New Romantics and the fact that I had a girlfriend and she spoke to me and I said, I've got to put you on this song, yeah. Fate to Grey. I, I, you're, you're, hearing your voice is so beautiful. Mm-hmm. I, it's music. I have to put it on this song. And so that is not songwriting. That was not production. That was just me in the room of being in a band. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously, four years later, I'm going, well, what would it have been like if I wasn't in that room? Mm-hmm. What would yeah, it have been yeah, like yeah. if I hadn't put Bizarre together? Mm-hmm. What would it have been like if I was just a drummer and I joined the skids and I never mm-hmm. never DJs? There's a joke on um, YouTube of uh, David Bowie, Tony Fisconti, 
and Brian Eno oh, yes. in the recording <laughs> studio. Have you seen it? Yes. Yeah. And it's a yeah. cartoon. It's a we reference a cartoon. it in the podcast. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. this is Tony Visconti doing much more than his <laughs> credit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I am co-producing this record, so it's not a big problem for me. Doing a lot of co-production, probably more than people think. Here we go. Is that yeah, you? Is that you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there is also, if you are a David Bowie fan, yeah. there is also another fan film of how David Bowie composed Warzawa yeah. mm-hmm. when he was on the train going through Poland and whatever because yeah. he didn't like to fly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he actually had a stopover in Warzawa and he went in a record shop and he got the Gregorian chance, didn't he? <laughs> so he picked up his album and he literally copied Copy it. it. <laughs> <laughs> That's Bowie. Yeah, you should see that. Yeah, Bowie, you know, the genius. Yeah. There he goes. The magpie. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It basically, it's Brian Eno going, well, I've just listened to Silver Cloud, which is La Dusseldorf. Mm-hmm. I think we should do something like that. And I don't know if you know, but they had the whole, they tried to get Michael Rowther on guitar from um, – <coughs> Um, Noy, yeah. and um, his manager said, you won't believe it, some bloke called up and said, David Bowie wants you. <laughs> <laughs> Back in those days, you wouldn't believe it, right? Mm-hmm. So he missed, he missed that gig. Wow. Anyway, to end, because you want to end, um, mm. basically, if you listen to Silver Cloud uh, and imagine Brian Eno playing it in the studio to David Bowie and then going out for um, lunch, and Tony Visconti goes out standing next to Hansa by the wall in the studio and he's seeing a girl who's doing backing vocals on the album and he kisses her and Bowie sees this out the window and he looks over at the wall and he imagines that she's on the other side of the wall and he writes heroes. Mm. That's how he wrote heroes and the guns shot above our head and we kissed (laughs) and he wrote that in that lunch break but if you listen to if you listen to silver cloud you'll go oh my god that's heroes And I used to play Silver Cloud and Heroes together, together. in the okay. club. Yeah, and basically, and it's got a stop in it. It's got a beautiful stop. So anyway, as a fan of music, I've just told you a story. And if you are listening to Known Pleasures and you Google it and you find Silver Cloud and then you find Heroes, then you find Michael Rowther, and then you say, okay, stop listening to us and you play them and then come back. The, the bottom line is, what is an influence? Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, what? who did what in the studio? Mm-hmm. Now with artificial intelligence, if I wrote those words as I walked the streets alone, well, I didn't write all those words. Zane wrote half those words, but he wrote something that I changed. Mm-hmm. But now we're, elite, we're we're writers. You know, do you understand? Yeah. So what I'm saying is, when when I was in the studio, I wrote. I stood there in hands up by the wall. I wrote lots of blocks are all around neon licht and sound on sound, and then it's standing, standing by Daimora. The wall is called Daimora. That's what it says there. And I wrote that there, but I didn't say I wrote that song. Mm. I listened to the Yellow Magic Orchestra and I said, Mitch, dun, 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 And we basically tried to do a Yellow Magic Orchestra yeah. and we came up with Moon Over Moscow. You know, <laughs> I didn't say I wrote that, mm. you know. So um, to end, am I a songwriter? Well, I did write a load of songs. Did you write Fate Great? No. Who said you didn't write? Well, Mitch wrote the lyrics. Did Mitch write Tar? No, Steve wrote the lyrics. Did Mitch write Moon Over Moscow? Can't actually remember because it's only one one word. I don't know. One of us did it, you know, and so on and so forth. So as I write my book mm. with a really good journalist who knows all about what I want to talk about, 
Um, I'm like, who, am I going to upset someone if I sort of say, and I'm going, yeah, but I am going to retire. Do I really care? Yeah. Mm. I'd rather be honest about how I feel and say how I feel. Mm-hmm. And I personally think if you three guys are Depeche Mode, which one of you is Fletch? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I like that. That's, that's, that's a really that's good that, question. That's a good ending to the that's podcast. That's a great ending to the <laughs> podcast. Which one is Fletch?